NTV Television Network presents The Other Day Current Era 1995 Translation and Voiceover by BMI Russian Good evening and welcome to episode 35 of The Other Day Current Era, modern day events for the history books. And today we're covering 1995, NATO's expansion to the east, the Neftegorsk earthquake, Kafelnikov, the world-famous Russian tennis player, Budyanovsk, Listiev's murder, the construction boom in Moscow, the Bratva new US dollars, splashing of orange juice. The entire world has seen this footage and such behavior on behalf of Monica during the post-election celebration is seen as circumstantial evidence of Keeping with the tradition of somewhat vulgar jokes about Vovichka, a German company markets a beverage in Russia bearing a name that was somewhat vulgar to the Russian ear, Hershey. Commercials showcasing foreign goods now featured characters from closer to home. Ads filmed in the West didn't really work in Russia. Our viewers had their own peculiar tastes. Foreign products were appreciated, foreign commercials not so much. Actress Inna Ulyanova, who played a translator in the Pakrovsky Gate, was now providing her neighbors with Comet. I've used everything. Isn't getting any cleaner. You have much to learn. Comet is a state-of-the-art remedy. Panadol was represented by Maria. Hello, Maria. We just popped in to say thank you. Hi. Your kid looks great. The entire country was happy to see Aunt Asia come over with the Ace brand bleach. Now it is torn. Meanwhile, Sidorov the troublemaker was drinking his sodas like veterans would shoot vodka on Victory Day. Hershey Cola, the taste of victory. Japan appeared to be living in the 21st century, with the world's finest electronics, the fastest trains, and an industrious people. This land of computers and tea ceremonies appeared to be the perfect blend of modern and traditional. However, in 1995, it turned out that even the prosperous Japan was still prone to horrifying events, devastating natural disasters and ruthless terrorist acts. 250 miles away from Tokyo, an earthquake hit the city of Kobe, turning it into a pile of rubble. Though the entire world was convinced that Japanese buildings were earthquake-proof, five and a half thousand people died in the first few hours, 500 more later in hospitals, and the city had to be fully rebuilt. Two months later, some terrorists dispersed poisonous sarin gas in the Tokyo subway. Twelve people received a fatal dose, thousands more were poisoned to various degrees of severity. Blame for the act was placed upon a religious cult called Aum Shinrikyo and its leader Shoko Asahara. In buildings owned by the sect, they found evidence of poison and weapons manufacturing. All of the sect's leaders were arrested, and apparently Asahara's intention was to bring the doomsday closer. Then there was the Russian involvement in the Aum Shinrikyo case. With support from authorities, the sect was active in Moscow, holding events at Olympijsky Stadium, while Asahara was a regular on TV and radio. The sect's combat units were trained by Russian instructors, and Asahara even bought a helicopter in Russia, as they'd later say, for dispersing toxic gases over Tokyo. Soon they were declared a totalitarian sect in our parts, their registration revoked by a court. The Yuri Grigorovich era in Russian ballet comes to an end. For 31 years he was the Bolshoi's leading ballet master. Conflict was a recurring theme in the world of theater, and there was one dispute where authorities were not on the side of Grigorovich, which meant the Bolshoi would now be run by Vladimir Kakanin. The new system of management included such a position as director-slash-art supervisor, which was assumed by Vladimir Vasilyev, another one of Grigorovich's opponents. When resigning, Grigorovich promised that he would never again set foot in the Bolshoi. Those actors who supported him staged the first ever strike in the history of the theater. On March 10th, they came out onto the stage and announced that Romeo and Juliet was cancelled. This is my first time in the Bolshoi and I'm really upset that they ruined our evening. Even when miners go on strike, at least they give an advance warning. So I came here, I bought a ticket with my own money, and I want to see a play. If they've got issues, it's their problem. Famous directors from other theaters were offered to work, but it'd be a long time before the next important premiere. 
1995, small wholesale markets and fairs entered the trade game and by the year's end had won the race. For example, in Moscow there were now 10 times more of them than a year before. All around the country, people were shopping at empty lots filled with large metal containers, which were given the name Optovki. Your middlemen meant cheaper goods. The most frugal folks would team up with neighbors and buy entire shipments at even lower prices. It was commonplace to buy a month's supply of non-perishables at Optovkas in order to beat inflation. And with small wholesale blossoming, lines once again became a thing. Standing in line at such a market was very much appropriate, but not because they sold exclusive goods, but because money was worth more than time. While the hunters were loading their rifles, On February 1, 1995, State Duma Deputy for LDPR Sergei Skarchkin was murdered. People soon found out that he had a questionable reputation. He was one of Moscow province's vodka barons, and one year prior he shot two people up with a machine gun, out of self-defense according to the official verdict. A series of grievous crimes had begun involving State Duma deputies and especially their assistants. Skarichkin feared for his life. He sent his family to London and promised that if something were to happen to him, his money was ready to be transferred ahead of him. However, there was no information on whether the prepaid revenge services were ever rendered. LDPR's leader was accusing people left and right, claiming that the businessman from Zaraisk was assassinated on political grounds. However, investigators confirmed that the motivation was purely criminal. That same month, Deputy Pcholkin's assistant Vladimir Orlov was also killed. He was shot by another deputy's assistant. The people learned that tax money was paying for five assistants per deputy. And on top of them, each elected official could have an unlimited number of volunteer assistants. For example, Zhirinovsky had a whopping 129 of those. The assumption was that deputies were not hiring assistants out of altruism. In fact, the thousands of servants to public servants were receiving some sort of official status thanks to their credentials. Later, the convicted felon Billenstein was also murdered. Zhirinovsky lost his helper Zen, then LDPR deputy Filatov lost two of his men. One named Usov was shot, the other, friend Savage, died in a bombing. In 1995, more and more sports fans were beginning to enjoy watching basketball both in Russia and globally. In Russia, thanks to CSK's success in the European Club League, globally and in the US in particular, due to his heirness Michael Jordan making his return to the basketball court after an 18-month hiatus. CSK was beating out one European team after another and made it all the way to the quarterfinals to square off with Olympiakos from Greece. They won the game in Moscow with a 30-point advantage, but in Piraeus the Greeks got their revenge. The third tiebreaker was also supposed to take place in Greece, but due to some foul play the CSK team was incapacitated. Someone slipped tainted mineral water into their locker room, five players were sent to the hospital, and CSK with its weaker lineup lost the game. There was an investigation, but the culprits were never found. The incident was swept under the rug, and the results were not re-evaluated. For 18 months, the great Michael Jordan was playing baseball without much success and tending to his restaurant. But he was still able to preserve his basketball skills, and the Chicago Bulls were in the championship running once again. Michael Jordan was an American hero. The first ever superstar basketball player made a name for the game all around the world. The market was flooded with cigarettes from all around the world. By 1995, 40% of Russian smokers had made the switch to Western tobacco brands, who incidentally were buying out Russian manufactories. Russians used to always smoke Eastern-type cigarettes that were harsh and contained a lot of tar and nicotine. That was the sort of product offered by the cheapest Western brands such as Bond and Magnum. That year, the biggest hit among smokers was LM, closely followed by the more expensive foreign household names such as Marlboro, Winston, Camel and Kent. The more affluent smokers chose Davidoff and Parliament, with health-conscious folks buying light variants and ladies preferring thin cigarettes, brown-colored Moors or white Vogues. 
If ever cigarettes were a status symbol, it was then and there. Smoking also meant blowing smoke into people's eyes. With cigar lovers constituting the upper crust of the smoker hierarchy, smoking them was an entire ritual. It didn't even have to be lit up for you to look like a seasoned bourgeois with one in your mouth. In my opinion, there are plenty of people in Moscow, in Russia with good taste. I was amazed to see so much poor taste in New York. Twenty years after the historic handshake in space during the 1975 Soyuz Apollo mission, the Russians and Americans once again struck a deal to cooperate in exploring the vast emptiness of space. But this collaboration was more about economics than politics. We provided the Americans with freight vessels and a space station, a multi-purpose docking system, and long spaceflight training techniques. In exchange, we received equipment for space-based labs and the right to use American shuttles to transport our cosmonauts into orbit. The first of our cosmonauts to fly in a space shuttle was Vladimir Titov. Later the shuttle Atlantis delivered Anatoly Solovyov and Nikolai Buderin from Cape Canaveral to the Mir station. It flew back to Earth carrying Vladimir Dezhurov, Gennady Strekalov and Norman Taggart. The latter had spent 110 days in orbit. This was the first ever interaction of a long-term space station with a reusable spacecraft. This assassination shook the entire country. In the evening on March 1, 1995, Vladislav Listiev was shot on the staircase of his apartment complex. He was the CEO of public Russian television and a massively popular TV host. At around 9 p.m., Listiev called his wife from his car to say that he'd pop in soon, but the killers were already waiting for him. Channel 1's director didn't have a bodyguard. This old building on Novokuznetskaya Street has a very narrow staircase. The first bullet hit him right in the shoulder. He attempted to run upstairs, but the second bullet caught him in the head, right under his left ear. And that's the shot that killed him. The hitmen left the scene, taking their weapon with them, but leaving behind Listiev's suitcase containing a large amount of money. The yard was packed with people for days on end. There were piles of flowers laid next to the walls. They killed the Russian dream, the notion of attaining success in this brave new world the honest way. On March 2nd, all broadcasting on every channel was cancelled aside from the news, with all of them instead showing a portrait of Listiev. TV was a powerful means of influence. TV hosts controlled public opinion, and the most popular one was adored by the entire nation. The assumption was that Listiev's activities as TV station CEO led to his murder, with him planning to rearrange the channel's ad rotation policies. On March 2nd, President Yeltsin came to Ostankino. This is a tragedy. Both for the people working at Ostankino, for every journalist in Russia and for all of Russia. On March 3rd, a final farewell was staged at the same concert hall. The Govaya Street was completely blocked off because of the huge crowd gathered for his burial. His grave would soon become a tourist attraction. Offering tours around Moscow. We'll visit the Vagankovskoye Memorial Cemetery, where we'll share with you details about the lives of Vladimir Vysotsky, Andrei Miranov, Vladislav Listiev and other extraordinary figures. 
The TU-204 airplane passes airworthiness certification. This and the IL-96 were the only two Russian liners that complied with international standards. It was 30% more efficient and could carry 40 more people than its predecessor, the updated TU-154. The best part about the 204 were the raked edge wings. The worst was the engines. The unreliable engines made in Perm had to be replaced with ones made by Rolls-Royce. The new plane could be used as a passenger or a cargo vessel, but it cost $1.5 million and carriers preferred to lease pre-owned Boeings. The TU-204 gave the Russian aircraft industry hope for a better future. A Russian cartoon received the Cannes Film Festival Golden Palm in 1995. Alexei Karatidi's debut project Gagarin earned first place in the short film category. The heroic title was given to a short story about a small person, a literal worm. Oh, there it is. Let's go! Think fast! Send it higher! Keep running! Hold it. Today, the last fruit fly perished. Given a volatile ruble, people in Russia mostly tried to keep their savings in US dollars. By 1995, the people had accumulated about 25 billion dollars, 80% of which were being kept in hundred dollar bills. It wasn't too long ago when few Russians even knew what American currency looked like, but now the decision to replace older hundred-dollar bills with new ones was met with even more concern than back in the United States. The U.S. Treasury rep came to Russia for a visit right after the new banknote was presented in Washington, D.C. to reassure the population of the country with the second-largest dollar surplus in the world that there would be no need to trade in the older bills. However, Russian banks were already counting how much they'd profit off of massive demand for the new dollars. They claimed that shipping the cash was expensive, and so there would be a 1-2% to exchange fee. Then America postponed the introduction of the new bills, and after they finally went into circulation, it wasn't followed by much commotion, especially since some took issue with Benjamin Franklin's face becoming somewhat puffy on the new hundreds. In May of 1995, humankind celebrates the 50-year anniversary of the victory over fascism. Celebrations began in the St. Paul Cathedral in London, then moving to the Triumphal Arch in Paris, continuing in the Berlin Concert Hall, and wrapping up in Moscow. The heads of 52 countries were in attendance, including anti-Hitler coalition members, Israel and Germany. Celebrations weren't about victory over the latter, but rather over fascism. Chancellor Kohl visited the Lublinskoye cemetery where German war prisoners were buried, there was a parade, and a statue of Marshal Zhukov on a horse was placed before the historical museum. Military vehicles were going past the Paklannaya hill where the bulk of the 30-year-long construction of a memorial complex was finally complete. As was the case with all important memorial sites in Moscow, the process was supervised by Zurab Tseretelli. Central Committee member Foreign Affairs Minister Raoul Leroy and other officials, In 1995, for the fourth time ever, a Russian movie received the Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film. 
Following in the footsteps of a war documentary, War and Peace by Sergei Bondarchuk and uh, Moscow Does Not Believe in Tears by Vladimir Menshov, the Oscar was awarded to Nikita Mikhalkov's Burnt by the Sun. Mikhalkov played Kamdiv Katov, who was a friend of Stalin. Ingeborg Adapkunaiti played his wife Marusia. Her first love, Mitya, who was now an NKVD operative, was portrayed by Oleg Menshikov. The roads are going to be nice and smooth. Slippers will be very comfortable. Socks are going to be nice and soft. But why? What do you mean? That's the entire point of building the Soviet regime so that everybody can preserve their heels just as round as yours until old age. The family gatherings and tea parties in Mikhalkov's unfinished play from 15 years ago were reminiscent of Chekhov's work, but with agents behind the fence. This was a Hollywood take on the Stalin-era USSR and the first post-perestroika Russian film shown in Western theaters. There were problems with distribution back home, and so Mikhalkov had to tour Russian cities with his film. Illegal industrial-scale vodka production becomes one of the leading sectors of the shadow market. Throughout the year of 1995, a good 1,500 illegal underground bottling facilities were broken up. And the first real obstacle preventing counterfeit vodka from reaching consumers was put up in the form of excise labels. The paper stripe with multiple layers of protection was an indication of the quality of domestic and imported alcohol. Of course, you could acquire a bottle without any excise labels, but in that case, you'd be acquiring a 100% counterfeit product that could cause some serious harm to your health. Two sensational 1995 criminal reports. In Moscow, the super hitman Alexander Salonik escapes from the Matroska Tishina maximum security prison. Meanwhile, in New York, the FBI detained Vyacheslav Ivankov, nicknamed Yapanchik who was known as the godfather of the Russian Mafia. They called Salonik the Terminator from Kurgan, because he saw every hit through to the very end. They arrested him next to the petrovska razumovskaya market, severely injured after a shootout. Salonik had a kidney removed at the Sklifosovsky hospital. Seven months later, he ran for it with his prison escort. Like in a cheap detective story, they descended from the roof using a rope. Ivankov, aka Yapanchik, was being accused of selling drugs and weapons in the US, as well as of extortion and fraud. Some said he was also making $300,000 a day off of casinos in Las Vegas. According to investigators, Ivankov still had ties back home. He was involved in drug trafficking in Russia, and he was collecting fees from his compatriots who were moving out to the States. He was being charged with attempted extortion of $3.5 million from a small investment firm. Both stories ended two years later, when Yapanchik was sentenced to nine years and Salonik was found dead near Athens. After decades of behind-the-scenes political battles, of bulldogs fighting under the carpet, the time had come for public clashes. A particularly entertaining episode occurred in June of 1995 during a TV debate, when Liberal Democrat leader Zhirinovsky and Nizhogorodskaya province governor Nemtsov doused each other with orange juice. It's already off. We've turned off your microphone. Well, that won't do. Zhirinovsky was claiming that Nizhogorodskaya province had the highest STD infection rate in the entire country. Nemtsov suggested he get therapy for his STD anxiety while demonstrating a copy of Playboy with his opponent's controversial interview. What a scoundrel! You lowlife! Gentlemen, please! I'm gonna throw this straight into your face! This is where they cut the program short. The footage with Nemtsov retaliating wasn't aired, which was an odd choice as they even re-ran this episode the very next day with how enormous the ratings were. Please sit back down, settle down, please. Unfortunately, we'll have to end it there. See you next week.
On June 14, 1995, the former village Sviatoy Crest that became the town of Budyanovsk was brought to the public's attention to never again be forgotten. After raiding Stavropol Krai and barely meeting any resistance, a group of Chechen rebels led by Shamil Basayev effectively took control of the district center, setting up base at the Budyanovsk hospital, where they were holding about 1,200 hostages after killing anyone who tried to resist. Basayev demanded a ceasefire and that federal troops be withdrawn from Chechnya. Basayev's team in a car and two trucks was pulled over at the city border and escorted to the police station to run a check. Allegedly Basayev was headed for Moscow. He was supposed to board a plane at the Mineralny Vodi airport. The Chechens killed the patrolmen, but after failing to seize the precinct, they took over the local White House and gathered most of the hostages right outside of it. From there they moved to the Stavropol Cry Hospital No. 2, taking more hostages along the way. We're on Kalinina Prospect in Budyanovsk. Basayev's team was using this street to get to the hospital, while acquiring more hostages and gunning down anyone who resisted. The nation was shocked by the early reports of humiliation and horrible violence out of Budyanovsk. Now that the conflict involved ordinary civilians, the people became furious with those who instigated the war and were then unable to win it. They were also horrified by the treachery, with Basayev's squad having gotten so far, meaning that for money whoever was manning the roadblocks was willing to let through even armed bandits. There was fear and confusion from feeling so helpless. For the first time this wasn't a war in some national autonomy, it was happening within Russia. Basayev made it through 52 checkpoints to get to Budyanovsk, and when a problem occurred, he would pay $100 and be on his way. The hospital was seized by 4 p.m., and by 10 p.m., following the arrival of elite special force teams, Deputy Prime Minister Yegorov, Internal Affairs Minister Yerin and FSB Director Stepashin fly in from Moscow. The army came in to surround the hospital. On the 16th and the 17th, human rights advisor Sergei Kavalyov attempted to negotiate with the terrorists. New units were brought in and the armed forces decided that it's time to take action. They had to completely rebuild the Budyanovsk hospital at its former location. This brand new building served as a reminder of how ineptly the rescue operation was conducted. They chose to storm the building. Probably not the best, but definitely the most drastic decision. Alpha team occupied the first floor, but now the hostages were under fire. They were screaming don't shoot and waving white rags from the windows. Alpha team was forced to retreat, and now it was completely unclear what to do. Then, to everyone's surprise, Prime Minister Chernomyrdin contacted Basayev directly. His conversation with the terrorist was aired on television. Mr. Shamil Basayev, I'd like to remind you that I am at my workplace, and I am responsible for everything that is happening right now in the country. I am ready, just tell me when. How much time do you need to confer? They discussed the terms for releasing the hostages. On June 19th, they sent a few buses and a refrigerated vehicle to the hospital, the dead Chechen's corpses were placed into the refrigerator, and Basayev's team left Budyanovsk, with 150 hostages as their cover, and accompanied by 16 journalists. The following evening, upon making it to Chechnya, the hostages were released, and the terrorists disappeared without a trace. 128 people were killed in Budyanovsk, another 196 were injured, 16 terrorists were killed, 15 wounded. Other tangible consequences of this embarrassing tragedy included Yerin and Stepashin resigning.
Tennis, the sport of kings that was instantly picked up by all of the elites wanting to follow Yeltsin's example, internationally wasn't all that popular. But then a breakthrough. Yevgeny Kafelnikov from Sochi, who at the start of the previous season was number 104 in the world rankings, made it into the top 10. The Russian national team, where he was the captain, put on a great performance at the Davis Cup, the unofficial world team championship. In tennis circles, Kafelnikov was known as the Russian Nail and Kalashnikov for his power and accuracy. He was considered to be the best at serving and receiving. By the end of the year, Kafelnikov was the sixth best in the world and the highest earning player period. At the Davis Cup, our team made it to the finals, beating the formidable German team in the semi-finals. The decider was a four-and-a-half-hour battle between Andrei Chesnikov and Michael Stich. The German had nine opportunities to win in a single blow, but ultimately Chesnikov prevailed. Failed. This, of course, couldn't have gone unnoticed by Russia's number one player, and so Russia's president arranged to award Andrei Chesnikov an order of courage for his perseverance during the match between the Russian and German national teams at the Davis Cup. In 1993, they liquidated residence permits, allowing citizens of Russia to live wherever they want, aside from Moscow where there was a special registration procedure, essentially a permit. In 1995, in part justified by the military operation in Chechnya, militia began to track down persons of Caucasian origin who weren't allowed to reside in the capital. Moscow's authorities insisted that most of the crimes in the city were being committed by outsiders, and that Caucasians were forming mafia clans based on their ethnicity. The general population approved of such national policy, agreeing that the situation had gotten out of hand, with the markets overrun by greedy dark-skinned folks. Aside from markets, militia also raided hotels, train stations, the subway, detaining anybody who fit a certain description, which spelled trouble for every dark-skinned fellow in Moscow who left his passport at home. Even Caucasians with permits were suspect, with militia even coming home to Federation Council Deputy Chairman Abdullah Tipov. After decades of official anti-Semitism, the government had found a new scapegoat. Some people were joking that Caucasians would have paid to be Jews during that period of time. Even when Glasnost was morphing into freedom of speech, Caricature portraits of political figures was still a genre you'd prefer to avoid. No such tradition ever existed in Russia, neither before nor after the revolution. Printing caricature pictures of the Tsar or the general secretary was never a thing. The first president was also off-limits. Right up until NTV started running a program called Kukli Dolls. Shows featuring rubber copies of national leaders had long existed in the West, as had political jokes in Russia. It was just a matter of combining the foreign format with our favorite kitchen pastime. The brave man who made it happen was producer Vasily Grigoryev. In the beginning, the writing team included satirist Viktor Shenderovich, directors Alexander Levin and Vasily Pichul. The first rubbers cost $6,000 apiece and were made by French puppeteer Alain Duverne's shop. But then a Russian craftsman named Andrei Drozdov was sent to France for an internship, and from then on he would make all of the dummies. The show, with its convincing storylines, props and costumes, with its classic-style commentary, went down as that year Year's main sensation. My fellow Russians, good evening. Tonight, last week's top stories will be presented by, well, yours truly. Authorities were paying close attention to Kukli. The acting prosecutor, General Ilyushenko, charged the creators with defaming certain characters who appeared on the show, as well as with financial violations. No better means for promoting a political program than political persecution. But then the charges were dropped, and the prime minister even met with his doppelganger in person. We meet at last. What's with the fat face? Russian authors were outselling classic Western popular novelists. The Russian action series was now in first place. A criminal drama with gritty main characters and a happy ending. Nikolai Lyonov, Viktor Dotsenko, Daniel Karetsky, Friedrich Niznansky, Andrei Voronin. Between all of them, the number of books sold was in the millions. 
The protagonists, tagged Demob, a guy nicknamed Beast, were inspired by criminal reports, forged by war zones and Russian lawlessness. These domestic Schwarzeneggers found the party's gold and saved the world from a nuclear holocaust. They were killing in order to survive. These were the first books to be advertised on TV, and the first books to be offered as bribes to traffic cops. Starring Tom Hanks. Congratulations, how do you feel? I gotta pee. Haha, <laughs> I believe he said he has to go pee. A new push to the east. On September 20, 1995, NATO adopts a new plan for expanding the alliance eastward, according to which one after another, former socialist countries were supposed to become members of the, quote, aggressive bloc. The Kremlin deemed this to be a treacherous decision. Turns out that for all of these years, while pretending to be friendly with Russia, the West was contemplating how to convert former Soviet satellites into their own, to then stand together against Russia, since who else could be their potential adversary? The first countries slated to join NATO were Hungary, Poland and the Czech Republic. The alliance was later planning to consider other Eastern European nations, including the Baltic states. Moscow was especially furious with the fact that NATO was in talks with Ukraine and Moldova. After a short period during which we no longer seemed to be apprehensive about the West, confrontation once again became the norm. Even the most dignified of our liberals were saying some harsh things. But for the first time in half a century, Russia's opinion wasn't taken into consideration. They claimed that Russia didn't have a say in which countries can join NATO, and that it shouldn't see itself as an important player in Europe. Some papers wrote that Bratva was the name that organized crime groups had chosen to call themselves, while others maintained that it was an old Slavic word with no such connotations meaning brothers. One periodical published a delightful picture of a church bell bearing an inscription saying, from the Solntsevo Bratva. Words like protection, authority, beef and take care assumed new meaning. You were abiding by the criminal code, calling for showdowns, engaging in turf wars, Commonly used linking words in criminal jargon were чисто and конкретно, which loosely translate to legit. Gangsters would use horn signs when gesticulating, with varying degrees of vigor and liveliness. The song that served as an anthem in these circles was Bratva Don't Shoot Each Other Up by Yevgeny Kemerovsky. Unlike criminals from other countries that were engaged in illegal activities such as drug trafficking and pimping, various estimates put the Bratva's stake in the entire Russian business world at anywhere between 50 and 90 percent. The most famous bros were from Koptevo in Moscow, Solntsevo near Moscow, then there was the Tambov gang, and Uralmash from Yekaterinburg. During an international chess federation assembly in Paris, Florencio Campomanes retires as the organization's president after holding the position for 13 years. Campomanes suggested he be replaced by Kirsan Ilyum Zhinov, who was president of the Russian Republic of Kalmykia, but the Russian delegation did not approve. Garry Kasparov disapproved. Anatoly Karpov insisted that Campomanes stay in office. Campomanes thanked everyone for having faith in him, but the decision was final. Though he did agree to be Fide's honorary president if Ilyum Zhinov 
Khrushchev were to become the actual president. The resolution came as quite a surprise. A Russian embassy worker read an appeal signed by Deputy Prime Minister Chubais and Minister of Sports Tarpishev, who were in favor of nominating Ilyum Zhinov for the post. The Russian president's assistant Ilyushin added a note saying Yeltsin approves. The vote for Ilyum Zhinov was almost unanimous, and Fide was now run by a young millionaire who was prepared to put a lot of his money into chess. On May 28, 1995, at 1 a.m. local time, the northern reaches of the Sakhalin were shaken by the most devastating earthquake in all of Russian history, with Neftegorsk happening to be in the epicenter. The town was completely decimated by the magnitude 9 quake, with only four buildings left standing. Out of its 3,500 residents, 1,958 were killed. The earthquake was predicted in advance, but there was no telling where and when exactly it would hit. Three weeks before the incident, the Ministry of Emergency Situations conducted a special training exercise, and the very next day after, there were already 1,000 rescuers working in the area. Over 400 survivors were pulled out from underneath the rubble. Hurry up, come on! Neftegorsk was deemed beyond repair. Instead, they planted a forest and built a chapel in its place. Building construction and restoration was booming in Moscow. New buildings were meant to look old, older buildings were being restored to look like new. There were 800 reconstruction sites in the city center alone. There is nothing to ruin, so this won't make things worse. UNESCO had long removed Moscow from its list of cities with artistic value in their image. New Moscow architecture was austere, strict, audaciously expensive and deliberately patriotic. And every building was topped off with a bell tower looking glass cap. This was dubbed Resin Empire style, in honor of Vladimir Resin. Moscow's building committee that he was the head of, itself occupied a building that best of all embodied all three construction booms. The early days of Russian capitalism, Stalin's master plan, and the Moscow miracle of the 1990s. The copy of the Cathedral of Christ the Savior was Mayor Luzhkov's pet project. Built to commemorate our victory over Napoleon, later demolished by the communists. Now it was being rebuilt in its former location, where the Palace of the Soviets was supposed to be built, but they put a big swimming pool instead. The only people speaking out against the new old cathedral were art critics, who first of all weren't overly fond of Konstantin Thon's work, and second, suggested that instead of building one gigantic church in Moscow, it'd be better to help thousands of impoverished churches all around Russia. And finally, yes, the body of the church will be there, but what about furbishing the interior? What about the murals and reliefs? And wouldn't underground parking make it to the Garage Savior Cathedral? The only result of the criticism was that the project's masterminds were now referring to it as a recreation as opposed to a reconstruction. Art critics were missing the point. Just like a hundred years ago, the official religion for the people and government was Orthodox Christianity. And the church had to be big, luxurious and old-timey. The primary mundane site was the shopping center at Manezhne Square. It was criticized for rising above the ground, contrast to the initial project, which ruined the view of the Kremlin from Tverskaya Street. The animal statues made by Zurab Tseratelli were like on a playground, just made using expensive materials, and they were situated too close to the tomb of the unknown soldier. After Palestine's leader Yasser Arafat signed a peace treaty with Israeli leaders, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and Foreign Affairs Minister Shimon Peres, some were saying that the signers' lives were now in danger. People still remembered what happened to the last Arab peacemaker Anwar Sadat, and now Arafat appeared to be the most likely target for a terrorist attack. Israel was thought to have the best security for its government officials, and therefore had nothing to worry about. In 1994, all three politicians received the Nobel Peace Prize, 
And in 1995, something inconceivable happened. Israel's prime minister and national hero was shot by a Jew. At a meeting for peace in Tel Aviv, Rabin was shot almost at point-blank range by a student named Yigal Amir, who was a member of a right-wing extremist group. Rabin was a symbol of Israel, the long-standing joint staff chief who was always at war with the Arabs, but who then decided that peaceful negotiations were the way to go. Rabin's associates lost the next election, the people were demanding stricter policy, and the warmongering Likud faction put an end to the peace. In December of 1995, a second state Duma election was held, and the popular vote was preceded by a somewhat decent election campaign. And though no expense was spared, the first ever attempt to use cutting-edge political technologies ended in failure. Homebrewed image makers were eclipsed by a network of local activists, and it was the communists who received the most party-list votes. Some were betting on ideology, others on personal charisma. The former included the communists and the ruling party Our Home is Russia, led by Cherno Mirden. They had straightforward programs, we'll make everything the way it was and we'll keep everything the way it is. Other parties had obscure programs, but their leaders were known all around the country, so their ads simply called to vote for Ivan, he's a good man. Zhirinovsky's party lost much of its footing, but was still able to get over 10% of votes. The only liberal parties to break the 5% barrier were Our Home is Russia and Yabloko. Gennady Seleznyov, a communist and Pravda's former editor-in-chief, was appointed as the Duma speaker. A new trend in music. The most popularity and commercial success was garnered by bands that weren't necessarily pop groups, but they weren't knights of true rock and roll either. The genre was becoming less about struggle and more about being light-hearted and loose. Agatha Christie from Yekaterinburg could have easily fit under the art rock category. Chiz and Co. from St. Petersburg under rhythmic blues. No Goose Fellow could be described as shameless buffoonery. But what really mattered was their unpretentious vibe that allowed the trendy new group to compete with Western bands as musicians and with cheap Russian pop music in terms of entertainment value. And that's it for episode 35 of The Other Day Current Era. And next time we'll cover 1996. Panadol, peace in Chechnya, the presidential campaign, vote with your heart, Korzhakov, Barsukov and Soskovets, the Macarena, mad cow disease in Europe, the Kotlyakovskaya cemetery bombing, Primakov replaces Kazarev, the attack on the Japanese embassy in Peru, Ivanushki International. See you for a new episode and a new year. Farewell.